I had forgotten. What was wrong? He tried to describe her, to explain what she looked like, but his mother just kept shaking his, her head. No, she said firmly, you don't have a sister. You never had one. Stop pretending. What's this really about? Which made him feel that he should hold himself very still, that he should be very careful about what he said, that if he breathed wrong, more parts of the world would disappear. After talking and talking, he tried to get his mother to come out and look at the wind eye. Window, you mean, she said, voice rising. No, he said, beginning to grow hysterical as well. Not window, wind eye. And then he had her by the hand and was tugging her to the door. But no, that was wrong too, because no matter what window he pointed at, she could tell him where it was in the house. The wind eye, just like his sister, was no longer there. But he kept insisting it had been there, kept insisting too that he had a sister. And that was when the trouble really started. Over the years, there were moments when he was almost convinced, moments when he almost began to think, and perhaps even did think for weeks or months at a time, that he never had a sister. It would have been easier to think this than to think she had been alive, and then, perhaps partly because of him, not alive. Being not alive wasn't like being dead, he felt. It was much, much worse. There were years, too, when he simply didn't choose, when he saw her both as real and make-believe, and sometimes neither of those things. But in the end, what made him keep believing in her, despite the line of doctors that visited him as a child, despite the rift it made between him and his mother, despite years of forced treatment and various drugs that made him feel like his head had been filled with wet sand, despite years of having to pretend to be cured, was simply this. He was the only one who believed his sister was real. If he stopped believing, what hope would there be for her? Thus he found himself, even when his mother was dead and gone, and he himself was old and alone, brooding on his sister, wondering what had become of her. He wondered, too, if one day he, she, she would simply reappear, young as ever, ready to continue with the games they had played. Maybe she would simply suddenly be there again, her tiny fingers worked up behind a cedar shingle, staring expectantly at him, waiting for him to tell her what she was feeling, to make up words for what had pressed there, what was pressed there between the house and its skin, lying in wait. What is it, he would say in a hoarse voice, leaning on his cane. I feel something, she would say. What am I feeling? And then he would set about describing it. Did it feel red? Did it feel warm-blooded or cold? Was it round? Was it smooth like glass? All the while he knew, he would be thinking not about what he was saying, but about the wind at his back. If he turned around, he would be wondering, would he feel the wind's strange, baleful eye staring at him? That wasn't much, but it was the best he could hope for. Chances were he wouldn't even get that. Chances were there would be no sister, no wind. Chances were that he'd be stuck with the life he was living now, just as it was, until the day when he was either dead or not living himself. So that's a fairly new story. First time I've read that. And I only, the computer only almost shut down once, so that was good. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read just a, a teeny bit of one story, about a, a page or so, just to give you a sense of, of uh, uh, kind of story in this book. And then I'm going to finish with a very short story, about three pages long. This is from the start of a story called A Pursuit. For some days now, I have felt myself to be pursued by my second ex-wife. At first, I believed, that the pursuer, I believed the pursuer to be my third ex-wife, and perhaps for a time the two of them were working for, <laughs> were together. For all I know, they may still be. Indeed, though recent evidence has suggested the pursuer, pursuer is my second ex-wife, evidence just a few days ago pointed to my third ex-wife. Perhaps the two of them are spelling each other so as to stay fresh and alert, while I, alone, a solitary ex-husband, have only myself to rely on. Perhaps the second ex-wife drives while the third ex-wife sleeps, and vice versa. But is it always the same car that pursues me? I can no longer say. I try not to think too obsessively about my pursuers, but who else, what else am I to think about? They are behind me, watching me, waiting for me to make a mistake. So far, I have made no mistakes. What, one might well ask, has become of my first ex-wife? Why, if the other two choose to pursue me, doesn't she? 
Isn't it simply that, time having passed, she neither cares for me nor despises me as did my two more recent wives? Perhaps she is merely indifferent? Until a few weeks ago, it had been years since I had heard a word from a single one of my trinity of ex-wives. I was living alone and isolated in peace near the sea, white stone, blinding sun, when I received a letter from my first ex-wife. This letter was written in a hand that, although admittedly familiar, did not seem her hand. Had my first ex-wife not burnt all my possessions upon leaving me, <laughs> believing as she did for no sane reason that I was having an affair with the woman who would become my second wife, and later still my second ex-wife, I could have compared her handwriting to that found in the letter, uh, which struck me as the work of a decidedly male hand. My first ex-wife had many faults, but she was by no stretch of the imagination manly in either person or voice. To see her name signed in a masculine script surprised me. No, to find an ex-wife who could be described in the mildest of ways as masculine, one would have to look to my third and most recent ex-wife. But even she wrote in only a marginally masculine hand, what one might call a hermaphroditic hand. <laughs> but no, as to my first ex-wife, no. True, it was her name scrawled at the letter's end. True, many of the letter's turns of phrase were, if not definitively her own, not outside her habits of speech as I remembered them. But no, the hand, no. Either this was not a letter from my first ex-wife or this was a letter dictated to her by a scribe. So I'll stop with that. <laughs> And I'm going to finish with a short piece that's kind of a cautionary tale. And uh, hopefully it will arrive in time for you. <laughs> it's called uh, Invisible Box. In retrospect, it was easy for her to see it had been a mistake to have sex with a mime. <laughs> at, at the time, though, she had been drunk enough that it seemed like a good idea. Sure, she had been a little surprised once she had coaxed him upstairs when he refused to speak and even more surprised by his refusal to wipe off his face paint or shuck his beret. But whatever, so what, it would give her a story to tell at parties. But ever since, she'd had trouble sleeping. She could manage a fitful hour, but then woke up, imagining him there again above her, naked safe for his face paint and beret and white gloves. She watched as straddling her, he carefully felt out an invisible box around them. He kept making gestures to remind her about the box, feeling it out again, steadying her as she approached in one imaginary edge, running his flattened palms along the box's ceiling just before penetrating her. It was a hell of a thing, at once funny and deeply disturbing, <laughs> and distracting as hell. When he was coming, pretending to cry out silently, she, she suddenly realized this was not a story she could bring herself to tell at parties. <laughs> Mostly passed out, she lazily watched, them, watched him lift the imaginary box off of them, get up and get dressed, then lift the box back in place over her. She drifted off, feeling it there around her, edges softly gleaming, holding her in. She woke up early the next morning to find herself smeared with white face paint, as well as a few loops of black, like bruises from his lips. She got up and brewed some coffee, had some toast, vomited. Her head felt wrapped in batting. The mime had not even been good in bed, though he had mimed being good in bed when she had picked him up. <laughs> no, she thought he had, been, he had been more interested in his imaginary box than in her. So she had slept with a mime. So what? In any case, it was over now, over and done. But it wasn't over, nor was it done. True, she didn't think about the mime for the rest of the day, but later that night, just as she was lying down to sleep, she felt something. There was the box, there was the box rising up around her. She closed her eyes and tried to sleep, but, he, but kept seeing the box, its edges burning in flashes on the insides of her eyelids. It was hard to sleep, feeling it there, and when she finally did sleep, it was fitfully, dreaming of the mime moving inside of her, shoulders hunching to avoid the ceiling of the imaginary box, white face floating like a buoy in the darkness. She brushed her hand through the box, but it remained undisturbed. She threw back the covers and got a drink and climbed back into bed, beside the box this time, but no, somehow the box was still over her, holding her in. No matter where she went on the bed, it was there. This is ridiculous, she thought, and tried to sleep, but instead sat there, staring at the inside of the non-existent box, wondering how to get rid of it. She got up and wandered the, apart wandered the apartment, read a little in an armchair, made herself some warm milk, drank it. She began to feel a little sleepy, she nodded in and out in the chair, finally got up and went into the bedroom, climbed back into bed. An instant later, she was wide awake, staring again at the inside of the box. <laughs> <laughs>